Hi, welcome to our podcast, The Game 9010. Um, uh, today we are going to be talking with Kevin Valenzuela, Dr. Kevin Valenzuela. Um, he is an assistant professor of biomechanics at Long Beach State University, and he leads the STAR program, has a private training business, and we're gonna dive more into your education in a bit, but um, just quick to start off, can you tell us about what you do with STAR program? So STAR program is the sport training and research program which is designed for students to get hands-on experience doing actual training and research as it relates to sport-based activities. So I don't direct the whole program but I'm part of the leadership team for the program and I specialize mostly in the biomechanics that we study for the different sport-based programs. So we've done things with volleyball and jumping abilities, track teams, uh, collegiate volleyball teams, youth volleyball teams, we're kind of all over the place at this point, even exploring baseball as a potential option coming up this year. Um, so I'm in charge mostly of the biomechanics side of the performance. Exciting. Um, is that what took you on your recent work to Japan? No, not at all. <laughs> Can we just jump right there? <laughs> The trip to Japan was part of a small grant I got through the university to develop international partnerships and that actually kind of worked out by nothing but luck and it had to do with me being in my lab last year working with some of my graduate students and we had some visitors from Japan who were wandering through and just wanted to see our lab. They came through as I happened to be in there and I gave them a quick 10 minute overview of what we do in our lab and they were really interested in the work that I was doing. Some of our work overlapped and after that 10 minute interview we just kept in contact through email and I was able to obtain a grant to go over to Japan and so through that program I went over there, visited with them, got to see their university, their campus, but we started developing projects for basketball based research. So we got to go to a sport performance institute that was located inside a sports stadium, which was awesome because I got to see a whole back end tour of the sports stadium cool. um, and develop some research based programs off of that and nothing else. So it was just pure happenstance and pure luck and just fell completely backwards into it. But at this point, we're currently involved in one project together with roughly 10 more that are developing out of that. So it looks like a long term partnership that's going to develop based on luck. That's wonderful. That timing was really everything. Yep. And you're in the right place at the right time to make it happen. So does that mean you'll have a lot more trips to Japan? I hope so. Currently, that's not looking very promising at the moment with our current climate, but mm -hmm. once all of this stuff hopefully passes over in the near future, um, that is kind of the plan is to keep an active work engagement with that group and hopefully have some back and forth collaboration where they come here, I get to go there because I really enjoyed the time that I did get to spend there. I had to cut it short because of the current climate of our society oh. um, but in the time that I did spend there it was phenomenal the people were wonderful the people that I got to work with were great mm -hmm. so I hope to go back on a very regular basis I apologize for my ignorance up front but was language no issue at all no it was a big issue actually oh. um, because I speak a solid eight words of Japanese at this point all right so I'm um, you know <laughs> not passable at all um, they spoke English. The two professors that I was working with spoke perfect English. They were both fluent. One of the guys that I'm working with was actually in Long Beach for four years long ago. So his English is fine. Uh, my Japanese is terrible and being in a smaller city, it's about four and a half hours outside of Tokyo, mm -hmm. uh, not a lot of English signs. So trying to do character matching was like learning how to read again. Oh, and wow. I ended up spending at one point about 25 minutes at a bus stop just trying to figure out the map by mm -hmm. character matching. I failed. I was at the wrong bus stop, which was 10 feet behind me, literally. And oh. it took me over an hour to figure that out. So that okay. was a challenge, to say the least. Right, humbling. But I also got to teach a class while I was there, which was a lot of fun. So I had learned a lot about for sort of breaking down my English so that it's not nearly as complicated and scientific because the students that I was teaching to were not fluent in English. Sure. They were learning English, but you had to break down science terms and figure out different ways to more simply explain the concepts that we were talking about. So that was also a pretty humbling experience for me to get to learn how to do that because we think of teaching college and they should know basic things at this point. Mm -hmm. But then you scale back on the language and it's a completely different criteria. So it was helpful to be able to learn how to or at least try to do that successfully. Sure. I can see how this experience stretched you in a lot of ways that were probably really unexpected. In a lot of ways from not just the language because I'm used to 
like I travel a lot, so I'm used to going places where I don't necessarily know the language, but anywhere that I go, I'll try and look up a handful of phrases, hence mm -hmm. my eight words in Japanese that I've retained since then. Um, so I'll try and learn a handful of phrases just to get by or at least start open communication. Um, the reading part was the hardest part though. But even irrespective of that, cultural, so much different than America. Food, so much different than America in so many ways. So getting to try new foods, new cultures, people inviting me to their houses when I don't know them and I met them like for 10 minutes, they're inviting me to dinner. So great. Not something that you would find here with any sort of regularity, but their mm -hmm. culture openly welcomed me. People offering to take me places, drive me places. It was very eye-opening from that perspective because the Western world just isn't like that. That's not how we operate in Western society, but that's part of that Eastern culture mindset and it was awesome to be a part of that. Yeah, to have a, a collective sense of that everybody needs a place. Yeah, and everybody's so welcoming and inclusive for anything and everything that you do. Even if you don't speak their language, they still invite you into their house and you try so hard to communicate and you figure out ways to do it. And some things are universal, you know, laughter, smiles, those are universal mm -hmm. emotions that regardless of the culture that you're in, everybody kind of recognizes. So we used a lot of that. And you use maybe some Google Translate or like photos? When I could get access to the internet, yeah, I used the Google Translate app, which was helpful sometimes, sometimes not helpful at all, because with some of those languages, there's so many different dialects and a lot of it's regional and there's so many characters and symbols that a lot of things just don't translate nearly as well. So some of it was still a bit tricky. But Jeez. you find ways to do it. You find ways to get through it. And I had an awesome time and I can't wait to go back. I love that you've maintained your excitement. I'm wondering about that caveat you mentioned. So if there are so many dialects and ways to steer wrong, are you going to actively learn other, you know, more Japanese? I'm hoping to pick some up before I go again. Um, so I've started using like a simple Duolingo app to try and pick up a couple words here and there. Um, so I'm hoping to pick up a little bit more. But even in talking to people who are fluent in Japanese, sometimes there are characters that they just don't recognize. And I don't know if it's a regional thing where they have to work like every region has different characters sort of like different dialects or what the situation is but it was fascinating to see even fluent people not understanding certain characters and i guess that's just the way it is and partly because it's a hybrid of chi different dialects of chinese and japanese so a lot of times the characters get meshed together and if i remember right somebody told me there were over two thousand characters in the language that's not daunting it's a far cry from the 26 we have in our latin alphabet which is so much easier wow mm. but you're not afraid to keep learning i love that so i was really excited to have you on on the podcast to talk about a number of things i love that you're both an expert of a particular study but you're also an athlete and you've brought these two things together to complement um, so maybe could we go back? You were an athlete before you were an expert. Um, and I'm curious, is it maybe your experience as a son and brother that led you into your athletic experiences or? I think our my athletic experiences started from just the time that we were born, right? I have two older brothers and one of them is seven years older and one of them is only two and a half years older. So even as we were born, I had the seven year old, seven brother who's seven years older than me, and he was already actively involved in sports. And mm -hmm. then the older brother was actively involved in them. So it's just kind of one of those natural progressions where my dad was an athlete growing up. He played professional tennis a little bit. So making us do stuff and being outside was just the way it was, right? Mm -hmm. And if you were alive in the 80s, you didn't spend a whole ton of time playing video games and being inside all the time. Computers weren't a thing back then. Mm -hmm. We were really outside all the time. It was, you know, you come home after the street lights go on my parents didn't care about that they kept us out for all hours of the night they was it small town gone. or city I don't, i'm not sure where you, okay anaheim anaheim but it was you know back then you knew everybody in the neighborhood mm -hmm. so you could be gone and it's a matter of two phone calls before you can figure out where your kids are okay so we were gone all the time our neighborhood that's just what we did we were playing baseball together we we're playing soccer together and football and basketball everything was fair game and there were lots and lots of boys in our neighborhood. So we were all on teams together. We all did, you know, pickup games, wiffle ball games, whatever it happened to be. So sports is just something that I've been involved in since day one, for as long as I can remember. I've been playing soccer since I was probably three. So I have over 30 years of soccer experience. I found mm -hmm. out I was a terrible baseball player. I still tried. Terrible basketball player, still played up through college. Mm -hmm. um, not in college, because I was not that good, but played for fun whenever I can. So 
it's something that we've always done and my love has not diminished for it. It's just evolved over the years from participant to spectator for things that I can't participate in. I find that actually unique, your take on that, because a lot of people do find a, a particular label or not making a team uh, uh, that it takes away their joy of still playing it. You know, and that, that happened to me at one point because when I was in high school, I was very small, first of all, and we had a high school team that was based on speed and size. That okay. was what they kind of supported. Well, I was fast, but I was small. Mm -hmm. So I didn't get a whole lot of playing time from that perspective. And my junior year varsity coach for soccer completely ruined it for me because I didn't play much. I would go into a game, score a goal, and then I'd sit the next three games. And it was horribly, horribly frustrating. Mm. And I ended up not playing my senior year just because I, I lost the joy for it. But then being out for that year, I haven't stopped playing since because I redeveloped the desire for that. And I loved it that much and realized it's so much more fun when you get into these recreational adult leagues. And it's some people take them too seriously. But when you kind of realize that it's for fun, mm -hmm. it becomes so much better. And then as I got older, I grew more and I started watching more of it. And my game kind of developed a lot after that point and it, I just started to enjoy it that much more and I play as often as I can and as long as my body's willing to let me I'm gonna try and keep on going with it just because I find it to be that much fun. That's great so is it pretty organic how you spread out because it sounds like you still are, are participating in so many different sports I mean do you kind of say like this season I play this and that and or just no it's random i try and keep doing it all for as often as i can um so i play soccer probably twice a week right now um, and it just depends on what teams are going on and who has availability but a lot of what i do is running which you can do anytime and all the time um, so i can do that before soccer games i can do that on off days i swim i can do that whenever i want so a lot of my sport now is more on my own time. The only real organized sport that I have is soccer at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so I just have two two time points a week dedicated to that. And I kind of build everything around that. Like I'll still play pickup games if people ask me to, but I don't have any active leagues for any of those things. It, but this running and swimming is regimented, isn't it? Yeah. And it becomes part of your daily routine. And I think that's the biggest sort of hurdle that people have with developing fitness and exercise as part of their routine is when you do regimented running like that, if you're doing marathon running or Ironman training or whatever it happens to be, it becomes part of your life, as much a part of your life as your job does. So sure. you just learn to incorporate it into the things that you do. So like when I'm marathon training, if I know I have a Thursday night soccer game, I'll show up an hour early and go run seven, eight miles mm -hmm. and then play the soccer game. Nice. And you just learn to sort of compound the train, the training and let it build off of itself so I figure out ways to kind of fit it into my schedule and I think that's been probably the healthiest aspect of my life is just the fact that it's become a continuous part of it so you know my day I try and start it off with a weight lifting session or a swim session or whatever it happens to be just because it at this point it just makes me feel that much better awesome that's really great do you feel like you need to have an event to keep you on task because it sounds like you kind of moved past that but i don't want to assume yes and no it depends on how i'm trying to achieve it so running i've done pretty continuously for the last several years unless i've been hurt for one reason or another but as far as maintaining a running schedule i've continuously run probably up to 10 miles at a given time so i'll cover it's 20 to 30 miles a week when i'm not in season or whatever but if i want to surpass that and start running like 13 miles and 15 miles i have to have something that i'm kind of signed up for because mm -hmm. then it kind of pushes me to go past that point so i think i've established a healthy mean of how much i run but if i want to supersede that for a specific purpose having something signed up usually helps because then that dictates the goal and i think for any athletes mentality goals are what we shoot for absolutely whether or not it's personal professional group team individual whatever it happens to be goals are kind of what we all strive for so i think having that definitely helps and are you keeping a written track or electronically just like these were the metrics i hit today you know i never started doing that till i was about 33 years old okay. and then i first started to really record how much I was running. And it was for no purpose other than I was curious how much I was doing in a given year. Okay. So I'd always done it. I always swam and lifted and I'd like, I'd program design because that's my background now is weightlifting programming and strength and conditioning and things like that. But I'd never really done 
written records of intensities and sets and things like that. I all just did it in my head. Mm -hmm. So I first started tracking my run mileage last year for the very first time to see how many miles I covered in a given year. And so now I kind of got addicted to that and I do it every time that I run and I'll be driving afterwards and go, oh, I have to add my run list to my log. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's addicting. Sure. Uh, just it's really interesting to hear how different people develop that process because some people are like, I have, have written down a number and they need to hit that number. So it's funny that you were already doing it and then writing it after the fact. I was doing it or I was doing the miles, obviously. I just never thought about it until somebody brought up. They're like, I had a goal of running 700 miles this year and it amounted to three miles a day or whatever it happens to be. And I started thinking to myself, I wonder how much I run in a given year because if I'm covering 50 to 60 miles a week during high intensity marathon training, am I 500 miles, a thousand miles? Like what am I achieving at this point? I had no idea. I just knew what I was running on a weekly basis and what my sort of program goals were to hit. But it's fascinating to see how many miles you actually run. I know a lot of the Ironman athletes will do that where how many miles did they swim? How many did they cycle and how many did they bike? Mm -hmm. And their numbers are just astounding. Yes. And I'm kind of disappointed I didn't track those when I was doing my Ironman training because it would have been fascinating to see what was I actually capable of achieving. Sure, sure. I really love, though, that in explaining your process, it sounds like you're highly intrinsically motivated because sometimes if you needed to see the numbers beforehand, that's such an extrinsic. You see that and then you're connecting that mentally to I'm going to hit that goal. You were already doing it and the written recording came later. It just sounds like a lot of intrinsic drive. I think for a lot of us who are not professional athletes, it has to become intrinsic drive because we're paying to do these races. We're paying to do these leagues. We're not deriving any real benefit from it um, as far as ext extrinsic motivation goes. Like, you got a finisher's medal. Good for you. Right. <laughs> Mine are all in a box somewhere. None of them are displayed. I don't know where any of them are. I don't really care about any of that. But challenging myself to achieve something like the Ironman races and the marathons. Can you do it in this time? Can you do it, period? Mm -hmm. And you see so many different types of people, and it's it's a matter of I, I set this goal for myself, and I want to achieve it, and I've done that, and I've achieved a lot of those different goals. But at this point, I'm not so much out for the competition amongst others. I'm out for the competition amongst myself because I also know I'm on the decline of my competition life. I'm past that age where we all start to physically decline, so now it's just a matter of me keeping up with my younger self. My goodness. So it's a derivative of intrinsic motivation, but it's extrinsic mm -hmm. in that it's me from way back when. Right? So we're going to shift gears to maybe he knows too much, right? It's a classic line from the Disney ride, mm -hmm. Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, you know quite a lot about this stuff and some of those hard truths. Okay, so I'm on the decline. What does that do to that inner motivation that I've got? Um, can you tell us something about your, your journey through school? I mean, you were doing ex activity and sport concurrently? My school journey is kind of a weird one. When I went through undergrad, I was actually a history major. So I graduated from Cal State Fullerton with an undergrad in history and a teaching credential where I did high school history for a short time. Um, but history jobs at that time were incredibly hard to come by. And so, but what led you to do that though? I mean, it to just, do the history it, part? Right, that was an interest or you knew someone who was doing that already? Um, neither, actually. I was, when I was at Cal State Fullerton, I think it was my freshman year I was a math major and I went to one day of calculus too and I despised it with a passion okay um, I took calculus in high school and managed to get through it somehow I'm not sure how because I'm pretty sure I missed half the classes um, so I took one day of calculus too and I hated it so I went through the next year not really knowing what I was doing took all the undergrad GE classes and I think it was the first semester of my sophomore year I took a world civilization class and the instructor was phenomenal mm -hmm. he just he told these amazing stories he basically just went up to the whiteboard he wrote like 10 things on the board and slowly checked them off through one long monologue mm. and the monologue was fantastic he told these great stories about all this interesting stuff about all this old world civilization stuff fascinating mm -hmm. one of the best teachers I've ever had and I'm sure he has no idea who I am um, but he just really inspired that love for history and so I changed majors as a result of his class um, I actually wrote him an email like five or six years ago it says here's what I'm doing now I was this because of you I'm no longer that but I was that once upon did, a time because of you back? he did and it was okay. a short brief thing where he just said he appreciated the words and that was really cool to hear um, but he was the reason that I got into history so when I was teaching at the high school, I was also coaching three sports. So sports were still an active part of my life every day. What were you coaching? Cross country, soccer, and track. 
All right. So running and soccer, mm -hmm. you know, the only things that I was actually somewhat good at. But so busy. Yeah. And coaching it was high school coaching three sports. It was fun, though. I got to end every day outside. Sports really draws together students in the classroom. Their respect for you is substantially different in the classroom. So teaching in sports has always kind of been something I did, but I did them separately. Sure. So after I couldn't find a job, I kind of bounced around for a little bit. And I was in, I worked for a mental health agency for I think four or five years. And then I decided to go back to school just to do like some basic stuff in kinesiology, like, cause I wanted to get back into coaching and strength training and things like that. Okay. And so I was going to do an undergrad degree and the counselor that I had started talking to, she's talking to me and she looks at my transcripts and goes, you already have an undergrad degree. Yes, I do. Why don't you just go get a graduate degree? Cause I've never taken a kinesiology class ever. I didn't even know that was a thing until like a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fine. Just go take the graduate degree. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. So I did. And again at Fullerton? At Fullerton. Okay. Um, and I went back just to do some like basic coaching education kind of stuff. And then I took a biomechanics class that I just really liked. The instructor, another instructor who really inspired me in that subject was phenomenal. He just made it interesting. He made it easy to understand. And so I started looking into that a little bit more and asking him a bunch of questions and took one of his other classes. He pushed me into the lab, got me doing stuff. And then they just kept pushing me further and further and further along the education. What about a PhD? No, I can't do that. That sounds like a terrible idea. Mm -hmm. No, no, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And they just kept pushing me and pushing me. And <laughs> eight years later, here I am. But you did, you left Fullerton to go get your PhD. Correct. Did they not have the particular... Cal States don't have PhDs as far as research PhDs go. And okay. biomechanics is actually pretty hard to come by in the California area. USC has a program, but that's one of the only actual biomechanics based programs in the area. Um, so I ended up in Tennessee in Knoxville mm -hmm. um, to do my PhD out there, which was a great experience for a multitude of reasons. One being a cultural aspect because the South is a lot different than Southern California is. And then two, I just learned a lot from the people that I worked with, which was a phenomenal experience. So I really enjoyed my time out there from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Hard from a cultural perspective, uh, but great to learn another set of, or another way of life. Mm -hmm. And you survived and you came out with a doctorate. <laughs> Yeah, somehow I got through. It was a lot of work because ours was a three-year program, which is pretty unconventional for biomechanics doctorates. And if you're doing that, you are really amplifying the timeline. So I think I started working on my dissertation roughly the second month I was there. Ooh. And so we started real quickly and I felt very much the imposter syndrome where I felt like I had no business being there for probably two and a half of those three years. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it was an experience, but I mean, you, I think part of the problem with the imposter syndrome is most people think that they don't know anything. That's the point of the syndrome, right? You actually do know stuff and you do belong there. It just takes a while to extract it sometimes. Sure. Uh, but I made some amazing relationships there. One of the guys who was in my program as well, he and I still work together on a lot of different things. We have... I think five different papers in review right now. We've published a couple of things together. We make class materials together. We do almost everything from a professor, professional perspective mm -hmm. together. So it's awesome. So it was very beneficial in many different ways. That's so great. I really think that programs like that are phenomenal because of how sharp and clarified that specificity, like when you're with your people and they're bringing their doctoral research, you're bringing your doctoral research, like that combination of people that really get it. Because there are so many wonderful experts in other fields, but they not might not have that, just it's sharp, you know? And it's, it's about learning who's got a different skill set than you and how they can complement each other. And that was the great thing about our, the lab that I was in is we all kind of came together and worked mm -hmm. and we understood different things in different ways. And that's something I've tried to bring to the labs that I've managed at this point. So I'm always trying to get my students at Long Beach's lab to work together, be in the lab more, work on each other's projects together, read each other's stuff. Um, because my colleague and I, I've read almost everything he's ever written. Mm -hmm. If for nothing else, and just to give him a second set of eyes, but it shows me his skill set that I don't have. Mm -hmm. He's incredibly good at math. He's incredibly analytical from a mathematical perspective. That's kind of outside of my wheelhouse. I can understand it, mm -hmm. but I don't have the same level that he does. My aspect is more on the applied side. 
So we really complement each other because he gives a good technical perspective and a good mathematical perspective to the research, and I give a good applied perspective so we can really smash ourselves together and be this sort of whole product as the case is, which has been a real asset, at least for me, I'm hoping so for him. Mm -hmm. uh, but for me, it's been a huge asset to have him as a resource just because he's that much better in that kind of stuff than I am. It's not necessarily about knowing everything, but having a great Rolodex of people who do know stuff and who you can sort of work collectively with because none of us are going to be great at everything. I'm average at a bunch of things, but I know people who are great at all these other different things. So I, I rely on them. That. I love that. How you um, can appreciate and build with other people. I think you kind of have to at this point because everybody wants to be so independent and so autonomous, but why? You're going to have a multi-part thing. No matter what you do, your project is going to be so multifaceted. The odds of you being great at all those parts is so, so small. Mm -hmm. Very, very few people can do it. I'm not one of those people. I know I can't do it. I know what I'm good at, and I know what I'm not good at. But I know how to find the people who are good at it. I know who to ask and how to get that information so that I can have a fundamental understanding of it. But why try and be great on my own? Why not work with other people? It's kind of what life is about, is developing these relationships that we can all collectively work together. And if he's that much better at something than I am, why waste my time trying to be as good as he is when I already have him? Mm -hmm. He's good at it. I'm just going to take his skills and use them to my advantage. <laughs> and he knows that and doesn't... Um, he knows, I've you. told him. <laughs> That's great. Um, can you... Tell me about how, because I know that you have some um, sport experiences that are pretty extraordinary. And I'm not sure if it was because you were already like an adrenaline junkie as a kid or if that kind of developed over time. I think it's more something that's kind of developed. I think like all little kids, when you're so, so young, I think all little kids are adrenaline junkies in the sense that they don't know what can hurt them. Oh, sure. But then as we get older, we get into our you know late single digits and our early teens, we, we figure out what pain is and we mm -hmm. understand that you do stupid things and eventually it's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. um, and I found that out just as well as anybody else. I broke my first bone when I was three and I have continued to do a series of them ever since. Um, but I had been, you know, a skateboarder and wannabe surfer and all that stuff. So I tried everything imaginable. Um, I've broken things snowboarding. I've fallen on my face skateboarding before. I've gotten knocked out by my own surfboard, done all sorts of fun stuff. Um, but as I've gotten older, I've kind of become one of those people who I want to try everything, mm -hmm. which is both a blessing and a curse. Mm -hmm. It's a blessing because you can fit into every conversation because you've tried everything. Mm -hmm. And it's a curse because mm -hmm. you never get great at anything because you're trying everything and you just don't have the money or the time to really excel in all of them. Um, but one of those things that I've really gotten into is skydiving and wingsuit flying just because I started doing it when I turned 18 just mm -hmm. because I want to do it. My cousin had done it. It looked awesome. thought. I'm going to give it a whirl. So I convinced three friends to go with me. We went skydiving for my 18th birthday, and I never really thought twice about it. Fast forward four years. I had my first Friday off after college and nothing to do. I want to try that again. So I went, and that was 12 and a half years ago. So uh, you went at 18, and then you didn't do it again until four years later. Correct. And you, of course, went tandem when you were 18. I went tandem when I was 18. Four and a half years later, or four years later, I went solo or did what we call AFF. Um, which is accelerated free fall. Okay. And it's essentially where you have instructors who kind of hold on to you, but they're not strapped to you. So you have your own parachute and you have to do all your own flying and all that stuff. Wasn't that significantly more scary, even though you had done it before, quote unquote? I don't remember being scared. Like I remember being nervous. And th I think there's a difference between nervous and scared. Well, you had more responsibility when you're not going tandem. Yeah, you definitely have way more responsibility and way more things to worry about, but I don't remember being scared, and I don't know if it was because I had done it before or just sure. I felt okay with it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's definitely more responsibility, but it's also way more fun. So you get to kind of be out there and free and on your own, and the most exciting part is when your parachute first gets pulled and you're like on your own for the first time, you look around and you're still you know, 5,000 feet in the air going, it's so quiet. Why is it so quiet? Mm -hmm. and it was really exciting from that perspective. And just to get to experience that was like nothing else. I think I ended up doing two jumps that day just because I enjoyed the first one that much. And then I tried to go as frequently as my monetary situation would allow me at that point. And then I kind of, I kind of didn't get too heavily involved in it for about three years or so. 
And then after about three years, I kind of started meeting more people and I had a little bit more money Mm because school was finally over. And so I was able to get more into it, get my own gear, go on a more regular basis. And I've had so much fun since then. Mm -hmm. I've gotten to jump in a bunch of different states out of a bunch of different aircrafts with a whole bunch of different people. Some of them really, really good. Some of them really, really bad. And I've had a very wide range of experiences from it, but it's not something that I trade for anything. And I'm enjoying every bit of it and I can't wait to keep going. Well, you're here now. Everything's turned out okay. But um, yeah, I'm gonna say, can you tell us about one of those um, really bad ones? So I was jumping in Alabama and I just moved to Tennessee, I think a year before that. And so I didn't have a ton of friends out there. So I went to this drop zone in Alabama for what we call a boogie. And a boogie is basically a skydiving party. It's like a weekend festival where a bunch of people come together, they jump a whole bunch, and they party a whole bunch. I've heard of this. They're a good time. Um, So I was at this boogie, and I went to do this jump with somebody. And we were going to do what's called a, well, he was going to do what's called a rodeo jump, and I was going to film it. Rodeo jump is basically where a wingsuit flyer has somebody else on their back just holding on. So it's another skydiver who just holds on to you and basically rides you like a horse. Not you, though, because you're the... No, I was the guy who was going to film it from the outside. So I was filming it from the outside, and as we jump, this guy lost control, and he side-slid into me, and he side-slid into me real hard. Well, those parachutes, when they're packed in the containers, are basically as hard as rocks, because it's a whole bunch of material compressed into a very small case. Mm -hmm. So... He started side sliding into me and I kind of looked up right as he was coming at me and he hit me on top of the head with the parachute part. Oh no. He didn't even realize he had You're hit me. You're in a helmet, right? I had a helmet on, but he didn't even realize he had hit me. So I had a camera on top of the helmet. It sheared the camera off. The camera smashed down on top of my head and ended up like spider webbing the helmet. So my oh. helmet was cracked throughout the whole thing. And I remember him hitting me and me going, that hurt. And then I don't remember anything for about seven minutes till I'm on the ground, standing on the ground going, where am I? You got a concussion. (laughs) Pretty bad. And I had no idea where I was for about five minutes trying to figure out what had happened and where I was. Did they save your life? Did what save my life? Did the other jumpers pull your chute? Nope. I had flown my own parachute. It was my main parachute. It wasn't my reserve. I just don't remember anything from the rest of my wingsuit flight to getting on the ground and wondering where I was. You still survived that and pulled your parachute open. Yep. When you were blacked out, basically. Essentially a walking blackout of sorts. Incredible. Um, So I got lit up pretty good. My concussion was pretty bad. And so I remember being on the ground and not really remembering what was happening. And somebody came up to me because they saw me kind of looking around like something wrong. It's like, where are we? Whoa. And the guy kind of looked at me that's a weird question to ask. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I guess so. But eventually I kind of picked my stuff up and walked back to the hangar. And there was a medic who just happened to be there, another skydiver. He started talking to me and examining me. He's like, we should probably take you just to go get an MRI just to, or a CAT scan, just to make sure that there's no brain bleeding. It's like, okay. And at that point, like I hadn't had any pain or anything that set in, like my head was a little sore. Um, but it wasn't throbbing or anything like that. So when I got the CAT scan, I was mm-hmm. totally fine. Um, so I got back to the drop zone later at night and I couldn't drink because of the concussion. They're mm-hmm. like, don't do this, don't go to sleep. You know, all the basic concussion type stuff. Thought to myself, you know, I can't stay here. I can't jump anymore. I'm gonna go home. So I start driving home and about halfway through my drive home, my head starts just throbbing. Ooh. And so for the next like five days, I was pretty much confined to a dark room because I couldn't tolerate any light whatsoever. Um, and that's when I realized how bad it actually was. That is a really scary story. Um, did anything ever happen with other people that jumped with you that day? No, he didn't even realize he had hit me. He asked me after he came up to me, like after I got his video. Yeah. After I got back to the hangar, he goes, where were you? We didn't see you at all. It's like, you didn't feel the thing that you smashed into. That was me. That was your head. That was my head. Um, and that was the end of that helmet, so I had to buy a new one after that. But I guess that really does contribute to the fact that helmets do save lives at times. Sure. So that one definitely was my saving grace. So it's funny because I actually have uh, the wristband from the hospital from when I got the CAT scan that I keep in my room at all times. And it's kind of one of those reminders of like your second lease on life. Mm-hmm. So I see that every day before I leave. 
How did you transition between the skydiving into the wingsuit activities? Because that's um, same but different. I don't know, like it, that usually skydiving is the intro into wingsuit flying. Wingsuiting is a part of skydiving. Well, okay. it can be a part of skydiving. It can also be a part of base jumping. Sure. But learning to fly your own body without the wingsuit is kind of a precursor to doing the suit. Because when you add the wingsuit, you add more surface area, more fabric, which totally changes the physics of your flight. So when I got into it, a lot of people at the drop zone that I was jumping at were starting to get into it. So a lot of us were kind of at the same level. There were probably 10 or so of us who were all around the same jump numbers. We used to jump together all the time. Mm -hmm. And we all started just naturally kind of progressing into the wingsuiting where it just, it looked like fun. And so one guy would do it, then the next guy would, it's like any little kid thing, mm -hmm. right? It's monkey see, monkey do, it. right? <laughs> if my friends did it, would I do it? Yes, I absolutely would. I am very much victim to that fault. Um, but they all started doing it. And so it just seemed like the natural progression for all of us to kind of start doing it. And of those, I think roughly 10 guys or so, I think nine of them are still actively wingsuiting. Um, we're all over the country now, so we're not all together all the time. You know, people get kids and married and things like that. So mm -hmm. it changes life. But a lot of us can kind of come back together and it's like nothing ever changed. So it's, it's great because it's one of those things that you can always jump back into and just know that you have friends who can do it and you can do it. Um, so I naturally got into it just following other people. But even as I've gone past that point, I've really, really come to enjoy it for a new level in terms of what it is and jumping with other people. But I've also, since that incident where I got the concussion, become more hyper cognizant of A, who I jump with and what kinds of things I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I worry mostly about myself first. And if my own safety gets compromised because of it, then I probably won't do it. Um, but we've gotten into bigger suits and different kinds of flying, but it's a new set of skills that you can always kind of learn. So working with those people has been awesome. Jumping with those people has been awesome. And then I've even been able to transition this into my research line for my professional development. So it, it's a great thing because I've gotten to blend my research, my work mm -hmm. with my fun, which is half the battle, right? Beautiful. Find something that you love and do that every day. And I wish I could do it every day, but take it when I can get it. So do you um, get to, I don't know, like swap out equipment? I don't know when you say there's a lot of different varieties that you can try. It almost sounds like it would be extremely expensive, like that I would need to buy this type of wingsuit to it try is. this. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, is not, it is not a cheap hobby by any stretch of the imagination. Buying the equipment is definitely expensive. Uh, but there are different types of suits. There's small introduction type suits. There's the really big types of suits that the professionals use um, for their racing or for their base jumping. There's different kinds of suits for what we call performance flying or acrobatic flying, intermittent suits between the two. Um, so it's a lot about trying those new different things. But the good news about developing this giant network of people is you can all swap stuff out. Now sure. it's all size dependent, so you have to find somebody who's similar size to you, but you have the ability to you know, exchange things with people and try new things. Um, so there are different options for what you can try. Like for myself, I own two different ones now, mm -hmm. and I try and split time between the two equally just because I enjoy both of them, but one's really small beginner suit and one's a much bigger suit that I'm probably not qualified for, um, but I've safely progressed into it and I just, I can't do the things in the big suit that I can in the small suit. So I'm kind of learning those bigger suit skills slowly over time. Wow. Um, as much as I didn't want to say, wow, I am amazed by the sports that you engage in. This, that's really impressive. I think I can liken that to riding bikes. I've got a little road bike and I've got a mountain bike. <laughs> like, how can I get to this level? I think I take a lot of time and uh, perseverance. So uh, you're writing this stuff down, right? I mean, going back to writing down, you have to write down your hours and jumps. And mm -hmm. Okay. We all keep jump log books and some there are times when I forget to write some of it down, but people track how many jumps they have, what their free fall time is, whether or not they've progressed. Some people are really good about writing very detailed things and some people are not very good about writing detailed things. I probably fall into that latter group, unfortunately. It's safety though, isn't it? Like today I learned. Yeah, if they're good at revisiting what they actually utilize, right? A lot of people keep journals and diaries, but they never actually go back and read them. So mm. is it a process of you just to get your thoughts out on paper or are you using it as a learning tool for yourself? Um, so I will periodically go back and check if I'm interested in something for one reason or another, or I'm keeping track of like a certain kind of jump. I'll keep track of that, but 
I, I don't use it on like a day-to-day -day basis to review. That's never really been my style, but mm -hmm. I'm also still new to the actual keeping recordings outside of my own head. I think that's a powerful point that you make. You know, sure that you have data, but are you doing anything with it? That's a really powerful point. And I think that's the hole that a lot of people fall into is they record all this stuff, but they don't use any of it, mm -hmm. whether or not it's actual data or subjective data, objective data, but just not exploring it for what it actually is. It's one thing to record it, but if you don't use it, what good is it to you? It's just more paper that's taken up or computer files or whatever it is. So can you tell me a bit about the training program that you do independently of school and STAR program, et cetera, um, that you, you run a, a personal training business? Um, would, could someone potentially bring their data and say, you know, do you see gains in this? Or is that, or is your training have to do with flying? Tell me about your, your business. My training doesn't have anything to do with flying at this point. Most of it's for athlete development. So I've done everything from people who want to lose weight to wanting to run marathons and just about everything in between. Um, so that's kind of the upside of the life that I've led is I've done a bunch of different things. So I have a little bit of experience in a bunch of different areas. But from my biomechanics background, biomechanics is biomechanics no matter what field you put it on, mm -hmm. right? There are certain things that are good for performance. There are certain things that are bad for performance. Um, and then sometimes it's very sport specific, like basketball movement patterns are different than volleyball movement patterns because of the requirements. But I think being where I am and understanding that different sports have different requirements, like I said, I'm never going to be the expert at basketball biomechanics, but I can study the movement patterns of it. I know the basic fundamentals of it, so I can research certain parts of that. And then in conjunction with my strength and conditioning background, sort of meld those two fields together or put them together to come up with the best possible program that we can. And then again, I know people who are experts in all these areas. Mm -hmm. So I use them a lot of times for consultation on different things. So I've had clients who do literally anything and everything imaginable. Um, so I, I've trained people to run sub four hour marathons. I've trained people who wanted to lose like 60 pounds and they've all done it. And mm -hmm. there are people who adhere to your programs and there are people who don't. And I think that's both the best and the worst part <laughs> of being a trainer is there are people who are highly motivated and people who are not motivated at all. Mm -hmm. It's the highly motivated people that make it a ton of fun. It's the ones who are not motivated who make it horribly frustrating sometimes. I can appreciate that, mm -hmm. sure. Um, I'm really curious in the training, especially because you've done such a wide variety of things. Um, is there kind of a, a couple of golden rules that you come back to or is it just highly personalized? It just depends on who they are and what they need. Or are there some things that you're like, I always say that in every session. I just, this I think, is a, I don't know, a mantra. Or a I think the only thing that's universally applicable to all the people that I've worked with and all the people who want to be in some sort of fitness or sport or whatever is you have to be self-motivated. If you're not, it's not going to last. It has to become part of your regular routine. If it's not, it's not going to last. You think about something like the biggest loser challenge that they've had. Mm -hmm. And if you read articles on a lot of those people, they might lose 100, 150 pounds on this show. Dramatic. And then two months later, they gain it all back. Why? That's because they were only doing it for the show and nothing about the lifestyle changed. This has to become part of your lifestyle if you're going to succeed at it. If you're going to make it a lasting effect, it has to be part of your life. And it has to be an important part of your life. And I think that's hard for people to gather because we're in a society where we prioritize work. Mm -hmm. Work is what we do. That is our number one thing mm -hmm. for almost everybody. But it can't be your only thing. And I think that's one of the upsides of the younger generation now is that they're really starting to prioritize things outside of work. Probably too much so at this point, but nonetheless, at least there's somewhat it's of a, a cultural pendulum. shift. Yeah, <laughs> it's a pendulum effect, like you said. So there's at least a cultural shift where we're starting to prioritize things outside of that. And I hope that exercise really latches on as one of those things because it is that important to make it part of your lifestyle. Start your day. Every day I'm going to do this before I go to work. Does that mean I have to get up half an hour earlier? Yes. Well, go to bed half an hour earlier, mm -hmm. right? Once you make it part of your life, you will succeed in it. That's the number one factor for that motivating drive. But as far as program design, the exercise that you do, that stuff is so individually tailored and should be individually tailored because everybody's different. Everyone has different movement patterns. Everyone has different needs, different things that they like, different things that they don't like. To have one program for everybody 
is almost irresponsible. Mm -hmm. And I realize that it happens a lot because we talk about, and I feel bad for the strength and conditioning coaches for like uh, colleges where they have to work with five, 10 different teams. There's no way they can write individual plans. It's just not logical from a time perspective. So a lot of times they're doing similar exercises for each person. And I know a lot of them, because I know the Long Beach strength and conditioning coaches really well, and they are phenomenal with individual tailoring. Mm -hmm. But there's only so much they can do because there's only so much time and they have so many people that they have to work with. So I give them an exemption from the individual plans for everybody because it's not logical. But any sort of personal trainer doing one-on-one -on -one stuff should not have uniform plans that they're using for everybody. Mm -hmm. There has to be some individual tailoring because different people have different ranges of motion, different flexibilities. They like certain things. They dislike certain things. If there's things that you don't like, don't do it. There's mm -hmm. always an alternative. There are certain exercises I despise and I never do them. There are certain ones I can't do for one reason or another, whether it's an injury or whatever it happens to be, but I can't do certain things. Mm -hmm. So I find alternative methods. There's no reason that you can't tailor something to somebody, assuming you have the time to do so. So I try and really individualize everything that I can. And it's funny because one of the times I've talked to fitness professionals and like people who manage gyms and things like that. And when they're interviewing new people, they say, okay, I'm your client, put me through a workout. No, there's so much we should talk about before I really do that. Mm -hmm. What have you done before? What's your injury history like? What's your goal? What did you not like? All these factors that contribute to that. I shouldn't just put you through a workout that's irresponsible. What if I'm doing something that you're not capable of? Maybe you're coming off of a knee surgery and I'm saying we should do squats with 150 pounds on our back. That's dumb. It makes no sense. We have to talk. And I think that's one of the downsides is people have become so instantaneous in their gratification desire that we don't get the background information that we really need to satisfactorily address what they really should be doing. Mm -hmm. So before I do anything with anybody, I really try and start on that premise. And, you know, you get, and I don't want to say that I'm good at something, but you get good at something and people start asking you for advice and they, oh, what's the best exercise I should do? I don't know. Mm -hmm. How would I know that? What do you do? What do you want to do? What's like, what's your point? What are you trying to achieve? So is there one answer? No, there's never one answer. Very few things in life has one answer. And this is exactly one of those times. Mm -hmm. That's a great deal of food for thought. Um, honestly, just, I feel like that, especially what you have learned as a trainer in coaching, um, even in those younger years and then coaching now, just at, in teaching, this has got to inform a lot of the work that you do, even in um, a classroom setting as well. It is. And I think one of the upsides for me in being an athlete and liking and enjoying doing these active things is I've tried everything on myself and I feel bad for my early clients because I probably was a terrible terrible trainer for them I'm sure I did every bad thing imaginable that I could possibly think of I love that you'll admit that though I, I feel terrible for them it's awful but it's a learner's mentality to say I've screwed up I've done it wrong and I'm gonna do right by myself and by my future clients but to it admit is. I needed to learn and that's the upside is the people who succeed in this field are willing to evolve. They're willing to learn and willing to admit past mistakes. And I, I have a few good friends who are big in the strength training world between the people I know at Long Beach. I know another woman who does uh, Fresno Pacific and she's always changing things. Mm -hmm. She's always learning new things. She's not above going to conferences. She's not above asking advice from other people, taking research ideas, whatever it happens to be. They're willing to evolve from the bad things that they do or have done or have seen other people do in the past. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the upsides is I'm willing to try new things. And it's it's hard, especially doing it on yourself because you're so set in your ways. It's like they say doctors make the worst patients, right? Because mm -hmm. they don't want to actually adhere to anything. They want to do what they think is right. Mm -hmm. So they don't take advice, right? Trainers are the same way. They want to do things their own way and not take any sort of advice. So if trying something new on themselves, most of us won't do. And I'm guilty of that just as much as anybody else. It's, it's hard to break pattern. But when you do start breaking pattern and you start seeing the changes and the gains and everything, it just amplifies from that perspective. So I've been fortunate enough to try a lot of those things out on myself to see what I like, what I don't like, and try and use, I think, more science-based evidence now because 
half of my life now is the science-based evidence. Mm -hmm. I try and incorporate that, some of that into a very anecdotal world because fitness is a very anecdotal world, unfortunately. There's very little people who actually adhere to the science. Thankfully, more and more people are starting to do that. But if you go on Instagram or YouTube or whatever, you find all sorts of terrible, terrible information out there. Oh, do this. It's the best for butt gains. Do this. It's the best for thighs. No, it's not. It really doesn't work. It might have worked for you or what you're not showing them is all the other stuff that you do. Mm -hmm. It's like if you watch any of those commercials for like this fitness thing, like, oh, I got this body from just doing this exercise. No, you didn't. Mm -hmm. That's a lie. That's bad. Well, it's good advertising because it clearly works, mm -hmm. but it's a lie. It's not true at all. Show them all the other stuff that you did. Show me a bunch of YouTube videos of people actually sweating. I don't care if you look made up. Mm -hmm. I don't care if you look pretty. I want to see you actually doing something, mm -hmm. right? And some of those are the best, but some of them are also the worst because the form is terrible. They're setting themselves up for injury. You didn't tell anybody how you got hurt after doing that, how you couldn't walk for a week after sure. doing that. So I think part of the dissemination of all this bad information is one of the wildly frustrating parts of this industry as well. So I'm trying not to contribute to that in any way and always put caveats on whatever information I do put out there um, because it's not universally applicable. Mm -hmm. it, does it kind of make you end up feeling a little evangelical? I really try How not could I to be cut through all this misinformation. I mean, but you're at a university, so you probably feel some kind of like responsibility to say this thing that every is the trend right now needs to be like checked out. I do, and I try and bring up a lot of those videos in the classes that I teach, and I say we're going to look at this person's Instagram post, we're going to look at this woman's program, we're going to look at this guy's exercise, and we're going to dissect it. Mm -hmm. We're going to dissect it from a science standpoint. I want you to tell me why this is good, bad, or doesn't matter. And I'll get some very interesting responses, both positive and negative. Mm -hmm. You take any exercise and there's always positives to it. Positive is you can lift more weight. You might get stronger. You might do this. The downside is your form is bad. You might put this tissue at risk. You might get this injury. You might have this problem. So, I mean, there's goods and bads to anything that's out there, but it's fascinating to hear some of the students' reactions to some of these things. And a lot of them will just agree with you because they, you know, think that that's what they're supposed to but do. But you let them think about it first. That's such a fantastic approach. Like the critical think thing, you've already made an opinion about it. You didn't just walk in and say, I, you know, will diagnose this post. You're asking them first, mm -hmm. and then you can let them converse about it and maybe come to a consensus. Yeah, and I want to know what they think because those are the people who will be working in the fitness world. They are the people who will be coaching your kids, coaching you, training these other people, right? They're the ones who are disseminating the next round of information. So I think it's important for them to critically think through it. And it's not just bad form and things like that that we see because we see a lot of that but you take like any professional athlete who gets some sort of injury breaks a leg tears an acl whatever it happens to be and i like to show a lot of those videos too and say here's this acl tear did this person do something wrong i don't know what could we have done like what caused this what made this injury happen all right well it happened this one time but is it really this one time that caused it mm. or is it a bunch of things leading up to it that causes is the way that they train is it the way that they eat we have like we are this holistic enterprise we are this big giant being that has so many parts to it and we so seldomly address all of those things and i teach one subject i teach biomechanics in some concept but that is affected by physiology by psychology by strength by motor control all these other things impact us and i try and really emphasize that point because it's easy for me and I'm sure all other professors to get caught up in their one subject mm. where we think that our one thing is the most important thing on the planet. But my one thing is completely worthless if I don't incorporate this other one thing and this other one thing because they all drive together. So I try and get them to think about it from a multi-perspective orientation. Tell me about how your physiology class might relate to this. Tell me about how your psychology class might relate to this because then that kind of brings it all together for them. And I think that's part of the problem with education today is we just, we don't draw everything together. We tend to silo everything, which I think is a bad thing. So I'm excited to see a lot more research that's being multifaceted that's mm -hmm. starting to come out because I think that's going to open up new realms for us where we 
combine multiple things and learn to think about it from a whole or a holistic perspective. Sure. And build and rely on people who that that is their bread and butter and be able to pull it, like you said, with your friend, mm -hmm. that I'm not going to claim expertise in your area because I want you to come here and show me what you've got. That way I can build with what I've got. I love it. It's very collaborative. It's like any other sport team. Can't do it on your own, right? One person doesn't win championships for most team sports. Therefore, you need everybody to do something. So know what you're good at and use other people. So you are, uh, would you say that you are more of a team player or an individual athlete? Because I ha have heard experience on both sides. I think it depends on what we're going for. I enjoy team sports much more. Okay. So I enjoy team activities much more. Soccer is my soccer is my number one sport that I love. I love to watch it. I love to play it. That is probably by far and away when I'm happiest from an athletic perspective. I just enjoy that aspect. But I can appreciate the individual side as well. And that's kind of the nice thing about something like running. You just you go out, you do it. Swimming, you go out, you do it. Mm -hmm. But even with those, having a team encouragement system totally helps so i think about the swimming things that i've done and i've been through long distance swim races i was part of a relay team that went from catalina to san pedro we swam through the pacific ocean but having the people cheer you on and encourage you and things like that it's an individual sport as such because they're not helping me swim mm -hmm. but they're cheering for you yeah at they're some supporting point it's all you. on you but so they're still there for you they're giving you that team-based enterprise and i think doing that was just way more fun so I think about like the Ironman races and marathons and having spectators and other runners and swimmers cheering you on, things like that. I'm glad totally you brought helps. that up because I want to dive into that. And it's interesting, not team sport, more individually based, but you've taken on the, the team um, benefits in all of those realms. Mm -hmm. um, so you did the Catalina swim, San Pedro to Catalina. I didn't realize that was a, a relay. So Catalina to San Pedro. Correct. Okay. Um, you did pieces of it with how many people? We did two six-person teams at that time. Um, and I probably had no business being on that team because I was by far and away the slowest swimmer on my team. But you had a willing spirit. I, you know what? The people that we were doing it with were just so much fun because I was Ironman training at the time, so I was swimming in the ocean a lot. And I was swimming with these people, but I, I am not a swimmer. I didn't start learning how to actually swim, like lap swim, until I was, I think, 25. So I was not a swimmer by any stretch of the imagination, mm -hmm. but these people were so inclusive and so nice and, you know, these very good swimmers bringing you in when you have no business really being on their team. And I told them, said, I'm not very fast. I don't know how good this will be. And the lady who was organizing, oh, no, it'll be a ton of fun. Come join us. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you say so, I will come join you and it'll be a ton of fun. And it was. And we, what a compliment. It was. She was quite an inspiration. Um, she recently passed, unfortunately, about a year ago, but she was quite an inspiration for the community um, as far as open water swimmers go. And she was one of those people who she's think of her at like a professional level, but she'll swim with the slowest people imaginable. She, we'll have a ton of fun. Always positive, always a happy smile, bring in the crappiest of us swimmers imaginable, and then she'll swim with the fastest people. And she mm -hmm. ended up swimming on both of those relays that night because somebody else got sick and couldn't do their leg. Ooh. So she swam twice as much as everybody else did, all with a smile, just because she enjoyed it. It's and it was an amazing experience. Such an Im impactful thing to know and work with people like that. Just, And also what that teaches you about how the, the rising tide raises all the boats, you know, and the fact that you can be encompassing to people that that need a leg up. You're like, well, I remember what it felt like to be in that position. <laughs> yep, and I remember being nervous with it too because I was outclassed with all these people, but we weren't trying to set any records or anything. We were just out there having fun. It was people just getting together and being up on the boat all night. The captain of the boat played his bagpipes in the middle of the night when we were swimming. I swam through a school of jellyfish and got stung a bunch of times. No, um, weren't you in a wetsuit? No, you can't wear a wetsuit for those. If you want, If you want your time to actually count, by the Catalina Channel Rules Foundation, or Foundation Rules, can't wear a wetsuit. Do you agree with that rule? Yeah. Oh. Performance aid. Oh, it's kind of like corking a baseball bat. Okay, because it gives you some buoyancy, right? Yep. totally different. Whoa. Okay, so you not only swam Catalina to San Pedro, correct? Mm-hmm. You couldn't wear a wetsuit. Correct. You swam through the night. Yep. In a school of jellyfish and we're stung several times. Yeah, that was Thanks for just letting me absorb all the details of this story. Um, 
That's remarkable. Would you do it again? Absolutely. It was a ton of fun. Um, totally different training style because I remember doing all ocean swimming. I remember coming out of the ocean a couple of times when it was freezing cold and shaking for the next two hours. Um, and but training the, not in a wetsuit. Training not in a wetsuit, but the team was so much fun. The people were so much fun. Uh, I enjoyed every bit of that experience, and I wouldn't trade that for anything. We ended up swimming from Alcatraz to San Francisco once, which was a ton of fun. Can't also believe... a relay. No, that was individual person. That's not nearly as far. Catalina's about 20 miles. Alcatraz to San Francisco is like a mile and a half. So substantially different from that perspective. It still has such a reputation, though, you know, that they say no one could have escaped Alcatraz and swam across. Yeah, it was quite surreal um, to be in the middle of the bay and if you just stop and you look up and you see a whole new perspective on the city. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably what I enjoy most about trail running and marathon running and swimming in all these places and Ironman racing and all that is it's a new way to see something. Mm -hmm. You see a new city in a way that you never would have. You see the desert or the red rocks or whatever it happens to be in a way that you probably never would have if you just drove there. Mm -hmm. So it, it provides a completely different perspective for everything, which I think is a phenomenal way to see a new place. And it gives me such a different appreciation for everywhere I've ever raced or been. That's um, poetic. Um, no sarcasm at all. I think that's beautiful. Um, how many, I don't know, how many marathons, how many triathlons, What is? how many experiences, or maybe is it places? How do you keep track of all of it? <laughs> I don't, truthfully. I think I've done... I want to say 10 marathons. I've done, I finished one Ironman race. I didn't finish another one after some three flat tires. Um, oh gosh. Triathlons. What were you riding through? Nails maybe, I don't know. Oh. Um, triathlons, I've done probably a dozen at different levels from Olympic level up to Ironman level. Um, That's considerable. And all just in different places. And I have a brother who's big into the Iron Man stuff. So he's doing, I think, two Iron Mans a year at this point. Mm -hmm. um, seems like he's racing every other weekend. The guy is always doing it, but that's what he does. That's what he loves. That's his community. Um, so that's where he gets his camaraderie and his friendship from. So I I've kind of moved away from the racing all the time to racing maybe once a year. Mm -hmm. And I use that as an excuse to travel now. I mm -hmm. use it as an excuse to go see a new city. So I want to go do like the Chicago Marathon and the New York Marathon as ways to see those cities. Mm -hmm. I've done the DC Marine Corps Marathon as a way to see that city. Um, so I'm really just exploiting it as a reason to go travel now. Well, so what what's left on your list? I mean, have you got Chicago, New York? Have I you would, traveled to other continents? To race? Mm -hmm. Not to race. Not yet, anyways. Uh, that's on the list of plans to do. There's a marathon in South Africa that I really want to do called the Big Five Marathon, um, which is through like a wild game preserve area. So you basically run through the habitats of five big animals. That's so exciting. I figure that's just the way to see it, right? So my goal, lifelong goal, would be to run a marathon in every state on every continent and to successfully do the ABCs of marathons. The ABCs of marathons. You do a marathon that starts with every letter of the alphabet. Ooh, so someone else has already created this list and you can go and follow. You can choose your own, obviously. I'm sure somebody has a list published somewhere, uh, but I saw, I think I saw this in a running magazine several years ago or on one of the blogs or something where somebody was talking about the ABCs of it. I thought to myself, that sounds like a fun time. Mm -hmm. So it's part destination, part tick off these letters of the alphabet. How exciting. So, and you won't keep any medals. They'll just be the experiences that make your life worth living. It's not something I ever felt the need to display. I have them all. They're all in a box somewhere. Like, I'm not going to get rid of them, but I was never one of those hang them all over the place. Like, I think I had a couple hung up um, a long time ago, but I don't have any more of them hung up now. They're all just in a box. So mm -hmm. I know, and that's enough for me. I was never very good at publicly displaying my life from that perspective. So as long as I know, and like you said, it's all intrinsic motivation for me. I'm content. How incredible. Um, it's been really fascinating to hear these stories and experiences and what it has compelled you to do different things, whether it was the people or the location or, I mean, maybe you'll end up doing a race in Japan. I can only hope so. I hope so. I hope so. There's a lot of beautiful trails out there that I'm sure would be phenomenal to run. Um, and the culture is great, so why not? I know there's one in Jordan that I want to do. There's one in... I think it's Iceland or Greenland that I want to do. There's a great marathon or a great wall marathon that I think would be fun to do. 
Like I said, <laughs> new ways to see new places. Got to try them all. So is you have already mentioned that you've learned so much through training in the past, doing things wrong, rearranging the way that you approach now. So it, if you were going to go do an event in, in a environment, South Africa perhaps, or you know, you're looking at other considerations that might be difficult to train locally because we're always looking at things like um, the oxygen, the altitude, I guess I should say, hypoxic training. Mm -hmm. um, are there ways that you modify that so that you can be the best you can be when you get there? Or is it, I'm going to enjoy this journey? And It's a little bit of both. Um, and it depends on whether or not I'm shooting for like a specific time or if I'm just shooting for the journey to enjoy it. And part of it depends on the fact that most of us have jobs. We have mm. to account for our jobs. It's not like we can just disappear for a week to go do high altitude training. Mm -hmm. I have classes to teach. I have research to do, things like that. So it's a matter of can I build it around my job and then can I build something fun into that training? I'm willing to go do high altitude training if I can incorporate fun into it. I'm no longer willing to train just for the sake of the train. Mm -hmm. I want to enjoy every bit of it. I want it to be fun. Um, so if I can incorporate some semblance of fun into it, if we can make like a small vacation out of it or something like that, I'm all for it. And I've done that before where we've done like 100 mile bike rides up in Solvang and we've stayed up in Solvang for the weekend or we've gone up to Big Bear or Palm Springs or whatever it happens to be just to incorporate some sense of fun into it. Um, but a lot of times I'm just concerned with making sure that I can achieve the distance. And unless I'm doing something that's like high altitude specific, uh, which is obviously substantially different, I just make sure I train in the hills, running up hills, um, because I think that's the easiest part to account for. Mm -hmm. But outside of that, if I can't make it fun, I'm probably not going to do it. Uh, that's the best factor of all, the fun factor. Yeah. Um, when do you know when you're really ready? For a race? Mm-hmm. I don't think you do. I don't think you really know until you've actually done it. Mm -hmm. And I can remember my first marathon being what I would consider a disaster. And I trained so, so poorly for it. Um, and my, and I'm almost embarrassed to admit this, my thought process at the time was, don't drink water because that will make you heavier. Uh-oh. Yeah, that was not the smartest thing that I ever thought of. And this mm -hmm. was before I started taking any sort of kinesis classes mm -hmm. or learning any of that stuff. And I remember thinking to myself that that was the best advice I could give myself is don't put stuff in that's going to make you heavier and make you run slower. I didn't have any water for, I think, the first 15 miles of that marathon. Oh, that's staggering. Yeah. Your poor body. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I was destroyed and I hit the wall at 20 miles and I was just annihilated. I tried not to like eat anything. I tried to just go for it. Mm -hmm. And it was a terrible, terrible decision. And the recovery was probably awful as well. Thankfully, I blocked that part out from my memory <laughs> because I'm sure it was unpleasant. And I think now about how much different I do and I've become so regimented and structured in how it is that I race. But I don't go more than I think two or three miles without a sip of water in a race now. Mm -hmm. I went 15, my very first one, and my psychology has just gone the complete opposite direction, where now I know what I know about physiology and muscle performance and psychology and complete 180 shift. So I think I thought I was ready at that time, and then I go through it and I clearly wasn't. And even the second one that I ran, I did better but I still didn't do anything compared to what I did on the next seven or eight of them where mm -hmm. I knew so much more. Um, and I think even when I go into these races now, I often still don't feel all that prepared. Mm -hmm. Like I know what it takes to get through it and I understand that part and I'll go through it and at times I'll be feeling great and at times I'll be feeling terrible saying, I wasn't ready for this. I clearly didn't train enough for this. I didn't bring enough of this. I didn't do enough of that. Negative self-talk. Yep, lots mm -hmm. of it. And sometimes you just have to brush it aside and say you know what the journey i'm gonna enjoy it i'm gonna have fun i'm gonna see this town i'm gonna see these people we're gonna chat we're gonna do whatever because you get the people who are so regimented and structured and that they like they won't talk to anybody during the race mm -hmm. i'm the opposite mm -hmm. if somebody wants to talk we're gonna be out here for a few hours we might as well talk about some stuff have some fun is mm -hmm. it gonna make you run slower yeah it is but you know what i want to enjoy it so am i ready i don't know probably not but I'm going to do what I can to prepare for it. And whatever happens, happens. I think that um, 
that, that almost goes back to uh, what have I learned along the way. It's, it's okay to have do those disastrous stories. It's probably even very encouraging for clients that you're training to talk about, I want to do this thing, and you say, oh, yeah, I failed before. You can fail if you will ignore all of this advice. I think it's encouraging, but I don't think that takes away from the stress that you feel in the moment of failure. And I remember the first Ironman race that I tried and I had the flat tires and I didn't finish. I got disqualified by two and a half minutes. Oh, so I missed no. my bike cutoff time by two and a half minutes. Running was my strongest event and oh. I didn't get to do it because of a two and a half minute cut. Oh, that's excruciating. Well, and I remember being in the tent afterwards and I'm just sitting there going and I had like the worst day ever because I got through the swim and I was fine. But my bike ride was terrible mm -hmm. just because of everything that I experienced. I remember sitting there going, this is dumb. I'm never doing this again. I worked a whole year for this. I didn't even get to finish. Worst experience ever. Like three days go by. I'm not ending on that note. Good. I, I can't have that <laughs> on me. Cause if I don't finish it, I'm always gonna wonder and I'm gonna hate it. And it sucks cause you failed. Mm -hmm. You still know that you didn't finish it. You still had to drop out. But you know what? I went back. I trained harder, it became that intrinsic motivation again, and I got through it. And I ended up beating the cutoff time by two hours. So nice. I was substantially nice. ahead of the cutoff time the next go around. Um, and then I got through the run and I finished it. And I haven't done a full one since then, mm -hmm. but I know I can, mm -hmm. I know I did, so I know it's possible. But I can't I can't fathom what I would, what kind of place I'd be in if I hadn't come back to do that. Sure. And it was frustrating and it was expensive and I'm still angry that I failed, but mm. it's done. It happened. What can you do? And the mistakes were were propelling you in, in very powerful ways. Well, in it, terms of preparation and what would I do if, like thinking about contingencies. And you look at leaders throughout history and they're always saying, you have to learn from failure, right? Mm -hmm. You have to pick something out. I learned that I didn't know how to change a bike tire. Mm -hmm. I went and I took a seminar on how to change bike tires, both front and back. Fronts mm -hmm. are really easy. Backs take a little more effort, but I didn't know how to do that at that time. And that was part of my issue with the three flats that I had. I really struggled through that process. Mm. So I went, I learned how to change out tubes, fix tires, and I got that time down substantially. Of course, I didn't need it in that next race. So I, it wasn't a useless skill, but it wasn't a useful skill in that instance, but I had it just in case. So it I at least something you took didn't something. need to worry about. Correct. So I at least took something from it. Um, and I try not to call it a failure because I didn't finish, but I took something out of it. And for better or for worse, I use that for the next go around. Absolutely. Um, I love that you've already covered a lot of the aspects of the psychological um, presence that's always present because your mind is always a part of these activities, whether you're feeling very prepared or feeling very afraid or nervous or distracted or disappointed that all of these things are coming into play. Um, do you feel like there are some particular practices that have strengthened you, especially looking at hindsight at the lessons you've learned? Is it like this is a particular skill that I build or can use with clients? I realize that's a multifaceted question, so maybe let's just talk about you first. I've learned, and this is a really hard one to learn, getting amped up and stressed throughout the event doesn't help. Mm -hmm. So learning the breath part, like I was talking about earlier with the skydiving stuff, learning to breathe in the door, learning to breathe in the activity and just reset yourself has probably been one of the most valuable things I've ever learned. Um, because especially in something like running even, you get so high strung because you're running for miles and miles and miles, right? Your shoulders tense up, mm -hmm. your traps tend to contract and stay there, right? At some point you just have to let your arms down, take the deep breath. You can keep running, but you just have to just drop it all and mm -hmm. let it all kind of fall out. And I think that was one of the most advantageous things I've learned to do because some people say they play better when they're high strung or when they're angry and things like that. And there are people who do. They genuinely have better performances. 99% of us are not those people. 99% mm -hmm. of us need to just back off, let it down for a second and revamp from there. And I was definitely one of those people who I used, I, like everybody else, I always thought I was the exception to the rule. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm like everybody else. That's mm -hmm. the way it goes. But I learned that I have to drop that periodically. I have to take that breath. You know, you're running downhill, let the arms hang. Take the deep breath, let it reset itself. If you're constantly working up in the panic, 
you're only going to get worse. Even from a physiological standpoint, you're going to perform worse. Mm -hmm. So I think learning to take a step back and just let it happen and just reset yourself has been probably one of the most valuable skills that I've ever learned to take. And that has applied to everything from the skydiving stuff and the wingsuiting stuff and taking that breath in the door to if you're snowboarding and standing on top of a mountain, mm -hmm. you want to get all jacked up and adrenaline rush to get going. But in reality, you got to make smart decisions. And if you're thinking a mile a minute, you're probably not making the smartest decisions. So I always stop at the top of the mountain, take that breath and then drop into the chute and get ready to go for it. Or I'm playing soccer or running or swimming or whatever it happens to be. Every weightlifting set right before I start. <sighs> All right, go for it. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that breath has just completely changed my mindset and my performance so much for the better. Mm -hmm. it's so perfect. Just having the, there's so much that happens in that space of that breath about what it changes to you physiologically and psychology and just mm -hmm. the focus. Um, do you ask your clients to, tr to find a similar approach? I mean, to find the thing that they gravitate toward, whether it's the breath or whether it was driving for a particular goal, figuring out if they're extrinsically or intrinsically motivated. I think trying to find the things that work for them and the things that don't work for them is definitely an asset. And I think a lot of people, they don't grasp the breath concept because they're not good at just letting the mind flush out. Mm -hmm. I, th I think I'm one of, I want to say I'm one of the few people who's fortunate. I can have a completely blank mind where I'm thinking about <laughs> absolutely nothing. I've I, heard of this phenomenon. <laughs> I can flush all of my thoughts out where I'm literally thinking about nothing. It's staring off into space with nothing in my head. Um, and maybe that's a product of me not being overly smart. I don't know. Whatever it happens to be. I can just flush my mind. Let's, Most, call, let's call it a superpower. Sure, superpower. Most <laughs> people can't do that though, but they do understand the concept of something that calms them. Mm -hmm. So I think for a lot of people, it's about finding out what can you think about that truly calms you down? Not that you get excited about, because that's completely different, but what allows you just to settle in? Do mm -hmm. you need like rain sounds? Do you have to think about your dog? Is it your husband or your wife or your child or doing this thing, being out in nature, mm -hmm. what's going to allow you just to, it's all gone. What's going to do that for you? And I think a lot of people struggle to find that, but that's usually what I use with my clients is not just breathe. It'll be fine because most people can't do that. What makes you happy? What allows you to calm? And what's that truly tranquil feeling? Because that elicits the calm for you. And I think that most people just don't realize that. So rather than talk about the science part behind it, you say, what's going to make you happy? Mm -hmm. what's truly going to bring a good smile to your face and help you to enjoy this process. And I actually kind of developed that thought when I was doing high school sports, because I remember, especially I have one example that sticks out completely in my mind. I was coaching a girl who was doing the triple jump and I have no business coaching jumpers, but we needed somebody to do it. And she had never done it. So she's trying this triple jump and she's failing and she's crying. And I remember walking up to her and saying, why are you doing this? I want to try it. She gives me this long song and dance. I go, okay, what do you enjoy about this? Mm -hmm. I enjoy this, this, and this. Okay, think about it. Now go do it. And she succeeds and she does it. And granted, those instances are rare. It's mm -hmm. more likely that you're going to fail again before you get better at it. But it was one of those things where it's like, why does this make you happy? Does mm -hmm. this truly make you happy? What does make you happy? All right, take that, run with that thought process. What's the worst that happens here? Nothing. And I think for a lot of us who are what we call weekend warriors or those recreational athletes, we're not winning anything. There's no pressure on you. The only pressure on you is the pressure you put on yourself. Mm -hmm. So why are you doing this? Is it going to make you happy? Is there something about this that you're going to enjoy? If there's not, you shouldn't be doing it. If there is something that you enjoy, take that, make that your focal point. The breath part will come. The relaxation will come. And therefore, the enjoyment will come. Well, that's, that um, story is, is very relatable, that you could share it to someone and they can immediately understand that something that felt difficult, and we've all been in that moment of frustration where we feel like that thing is just beyond an obstacle and we can't reach it, and you're talking about you are the one who's holding the key to unlock that door and be on the other side. It almost sounds too simple to be true. I, th I think it is. We're all... We're all the gatekeeper to our own happiness, right? And that's not 
that's hardly my knowledge, that's just world knowledge, and many, many people have said that, but so many of us don't believe it. We think that our happiness is tied up in something else, mm -hmm. tied up in someone else. And I don't think that's the right way to be. I think you look at the most successful people in history and their happiness is tied up in themselves, whether that's succeeding at developing a business or achieving this goal or whatever it happens to be. It's all that intrinsic motivation. Mm -hmm. If you're happy with yourself, you're probably in better shape than most people who are extrinsically motivated. They always say things like money can't buy you happiness. If you know how to use it, it probably can. <laughs> If you're doing something that makes you happy with it, it probably can. I could think of a whole lot of things that I would do with lots of money that would probably make me pretty happy. So I'm not sure I buy that. I think that's an extrinsic feel. Changes to the intrinsic aspect of things that truly make you happy. And I think it comes along nicely. But how cool is it that you took advantage of your position as a coach to take this flustered person? And in, I mean, in her case, a high school athlete, but you could take that in any, any position. It's universally understood that you could be in a position to offer just that little piece of advice to say, hey, you can get out of your own way. Like, that's really special. I think the funny thing is, I wasn't trained to do any of that stuff. I didn't know anything about psychology at that point. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know what I was talking about. And it's not like I had any sort of background in that whatsoever, but it's just a matter of, and I, I think parents understand this more than anybody else. How do you make your kid happy? You find just whatever you can possibly think of to make that kid happy, make them stop crying, make them stop screaming, whatever mm -hmm. it happens to be. And I think it was one of those scenarios where, all right, this teenage girl is crying. I don't do crying teenage girls. I'm barely outside of teenage <laughs> years myself at this point. So how do I get her to stop crying? Mm -hmm. Well, get them to think of something that makes them happy. And that was, I guess I just kind of fell backwards into it and got lucky. And that totally worked for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. um, but I, and I think a lot of that's just built into all of us. We just don't realize it. So mm -hmm. you just need somebody to extract it for you. And I think that's kind of what those of us who are working with people are really designed to do just extract what they already know from them they don't mm -hmm. need the science part they just need the results from it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's really well said i i really i love that you've explained this in um, a lot of different contexts for us today it's been really good um i've learned a lot i'm curious if you feel like the path that you've traveled starting in history ending up in doing biomechanics do you feel like it's exactly the way that it, it should be to make you holistically arrive at the way that you teach and the way that you give and the way that you understand these concepts? Yeah, I, I think going through the history teaching, because I liked the style of history teaching much more than I liked the science way of teaching. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is history teacher, good history teachers will just tell you one long story. It's just one long novel, one long movie that they are just articulating so well and they paint a story behind it. Science, I think, unfortunately, gets in the pigeonhole where it's so concrete, so cut and dry that it's not fun. Mm -hmm. And I avoided science for so long because that's how it seemed. They never kind of painted the picture or made it relevant, made it interesting for me, or I was just a terrible student and didn't actually pay attention to that. <laughs> but irrespective of that, I think the history part really has taught me how to sort of paint that picture. Mm -hmm. And I try and use that in the science classes that I teach where I, I strive to really make it applicable to the day-to-day -day lives. And I use a lot of student experiences to do that. I ask them questions and make them tell me stuff. Mm -hmm. I can talk for three hours straight if I have to, but I don't want to. Mm -hmm. This is actually the longest I've ever talked. <laughs> and I try You're not, doing great. <laughs> I try not to do that when I'm teaching classes because they don't need to hear that. What are their experiences? How do I make it relevant to their experiences? How do I tell a story based on what they have? So I try and draw in their experience to explain the science aspects of it so that it's not so cut dry and for lack of a better word, boring mm -hmm. because it can be in so many ways so i'm grateful that i went through that t what effectively was a pretty tough time in life in dealing with the not being able to find the jobs that you wanted things like that but i learned so much from that process and what i can apply to this point because irrespective of that at that time i was teaching i had sports 
I just kind of figured out a way to smash the two together. And I still love history. I still have all my textbooks, all my novels and books from those classes sitting in my office. Mm -hmm. um, and I still leaf through them periodically. I still read them for fun. So I've never lost the love of that. I've just modified how I use that past information. And you never know when it'll come in handy at Trivia Night. Oh, it's so powerful. It's really powerful to take the you know the best of this thing and applying it to this thing that might seem completely disparate that's wonderful and i think very applicable like you say in having a holistic practice as a trainer as a teacher and all of the roles that you're carrying in your life even in your own per personal athletic pursuits and i think we get on these these times where we feel like we have to have this like cut and dry pathway too i'm going from point a to point b it's got to be a straight line sort mm -hmm. of thing and for some people that works out phenomenal to one of my brothers worked out phenomenal. He's doing so well, and that was his path. He was very linear in that standpoint. I was as curved as I could possibly be in my pathway, and I'm no different. It's just a completely different kind of pathway. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of students now are struggling with that concept of, well, I want to go to medical school. I want to go to PT school. Whatever it happens to be, that's what I'm going to do. I will be linear. Yeah, I mm -hmm. will be linear. And... Mm -hmm they don't realize that it doesn't really work that way. And I have another good friend who's in medical school now, but his path was so far from linear to get there. He went through working in hospitals and medical scribing. He ended up getting a master's and doing this other program and this and that. And he just couldn't make that linear path work. But now mm -hmm. he finally got to his destination. He's doing what he wants to do. But most of our students now see it as, I have to be doing this by this age. They have this whole life plan. And then when it doesn't work, it's like the worst thing imaginable. It's catastrophe for them. Mm -hmm. And they fail to realize you're 22 years old. <laughs> you're going to be okay. And they have to learn to deal with that adversity. And I'm not entirely sure what it is, but adversity seems harder for them to deal with now than it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. And I'm, I haven't quite figured out why that is though. Ooh, let's revisit that topic in another five years. <laughs> <laughs> That would be good, right? I'll come back anytime. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, your stories have not been boring. It's funny how I, I almost feel bad for your students that you wouldn't just extol the wisdom and experiences that you've had because they have been wildly exciting and out of the ordinary, but you are appreciating the fact that they need to connect. And if they don't tell their story and, and meet you halfway, then for you to extol the wisdom at that point. Like you're giving them that opportunity. Like, I'm not gonna talk at you for this class. What's your experience? No, and I've been fortunate that other people have done that for me. And I've had some phenomenal mentors in my life throughout my professional development. And I'm trying to reciprocate that and be that for somebody else where I make it fun. And I've had students come up to me and say, that was an amazing lecture. This is the kind of stuff that I wanna do. Like you brought that out for me. Like I really wanna do this kind of stuff. And mm -hmm. I say, great. Let's working. make you do that stuff. And I've, I haven't been at Long Beach for that long, but even up to this point, I've had students who have gone on to do things. One of my former students is a lecturer at USC now, um, and she's doing really well. I have other students looking at PhD programs, one who's starting her master's program, applying for this grant, that grant, this scholarship, so on and so forth. And so when I see them get excited about that stuff, it's, it's fun for me. Mm -hmm. And I get to experience that excitement all over again so I'm, I'm trying the best that i can to bring it to light for them and make them enjoy it in some capacity similar to the way that i do um so even if i can get one a year better than none that's so wonderful thank you so much it's been such a pleasure to talk with you and to learn more i feel like we actually could unearth a lot more stories because you've kind of lived lots of lifetimes already. I mean, I, we've hit on athleticism and your expertise and kind of like what's ahead, but there's still a lot more ahead. You're so not done yet. <laughs> Hopefully not. There's a lot of life to live and a lot of new things to give a try to. So only got one shot to do it. Just go do it in a smart way. Great, great way to end and good words to live by, right? We won't be, we'll use cal calculated risks. There you go. We'll still take risks, but we'll use them wisely. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure having you, Dr. Kevin Valenzuela. We're closing out our podcast of the Gabe 9010. Anytime. Happy to do it. Thanks.